Thank you for joining me once again, where we're talking about pH control in body fluids. What fun. This is part two, where we talk about the bicarbonate buffer. If you haven't seen part one, I strongly advise you to stop now and go and watch part one. In the meantime, for those of you who have seen part one, let's do a little recap, summary, perhaps an elucidation on the take-home messages of last video, the part one video. Here they are, basically. This with a bit of commentary to maybe help it sink in a bit. Consider, if you will, a 1,000 cubic milliliter sphere, or any other shape you like, of pure H2O water. Now, around that water, you will need to build an impervious barrier at this point, because we want to talk about this pure water as a closed system. Okay. In so doing, we can understand a process by which pure water has a pH. It has an amount of acidity, which is a parsimonious way of describing the number of hydronium ions in a solution that started out at the beginning of time as purely a one litre unit of pure water sealed inside a, an impervious barrier for mass anyway, at least. Okay. Well, here's what happens. The water will have a temperature. The temperature being an equilibration of, or a movement towards, equilibration of the temperature surrounding it, as the case may be. There may be other processes that change the temperature of the water, apply a flame to it, pack it in ice. What is heat? is, in practical terms, the rotation, the vibration, and the translocation of water molecules within that body of water, the movement. The more the movement energy, the more likely when you take two water molecules and you for want of a better term, bang them together, that there will be an interaction between those two chemical entities, those two water molecules, such that that'll spit out a hydronium, hydronium ion, H3O+, and a hydroxide ion, OH-. That reaction occurring has a probability per unit time largely on the basis of the temperature of the system. Okay. When you bang those together and you get out those ions, those ions, one of them has a positive charge, one of them has a negative charge, electrochemically. They find each other quite attractive. Water. Reactions in the water at large, the billions and billions and billions of molecules of water, the odd one of those is going on. It's a very, very, it can be quite a high flux rate depending on temperature and all that kind of stuff. But the actual concentration of the ions versus the water is very, very low 10 to the minus 7 at pH 7, which is what pure water is at 25 degrees C, because if you heat the water up, it becomes more acidic, and if you cool the water down, it becomes less acidic, as described. Here were the take-home messages from last week out of all of that. The temperature is able to cross the barrier of that system. It's a closed system for mass, but it's open to energy. It's not an isolated system. Okay. 
Temperature directly affects pH in water. Another fact following on from that fact. Temperature is a control point in pH, aka an independent variable that can moderate pH directly. That's one of four. We'll get to that in the rest of these videos. What follows from that? pH is a dependent variable. Dependent variable. Cannot be independently moderated. We'll talk about that a bit more today. The concentration of hydronium ions and hydroxide ions in pure water is codependent cause and effect. They can't get away from each other because they are necessary ramifications of the existence of each other. The actual concentration is 10 to the minus 7 moles per litre at 25 degrees C. Not much. Uh, at 6.8, that number is 0 0.0000016 moles per litre uh, versus a much higher concentration for the water. Much, much higher. At pH 7, as we've discussed, it's 10 to the minus 7 which is 60 parts per billion different from pH 6.8. At a pH of 7.4, the hydronium ion concentration is 0 0.0004 moles per litre, which is different from pH 6.8 to the exact absolute tune of 120 parts per billion. So hardly any difference at all. Okay. The next lesson today, this lesson, is as follows. Carbon dioxide gas, the partial pressure thereof, is another aqueous pH controller, an independent variable with which you can moderate the pH. One of four, and four only it seems. So today's lesson is about the second. The first one was temperature. The next one is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas. What we have to do for this discussion is we have to remove that impervious barrier from around our water sample. We have to make it an open system capable of exchanging mass with its environment, which you'll find water is, because water will dissolve an amount of carbon dioxide gas into it. It's a constant called Kc, however that constant is not actually constant because it itself depends on temperature, the lowest form of energy. Isn't that amazing how that turns out? Here's a teaser of what we're talking about today. Here it is, the reaction. Carbon dioxide gas, if it's able to interact at the surface of any body of water, will dissolve into that water, forming a thing called carbonic acid. H2CO3. Okay, that carbonic acid then dissociates, we're told, into a bicarbonate ion, uh, plus an H plus, we're told. And then there's another reaction step possible again, uh, whereby another H plus, we're told, can be ejected off the bicarbonate, we're told. Uh, thus turning it from a base into an acid in that, in that context uh, and produces carbonate with a 2 minus charge plus, you know, obviously we've got 2H plus there. Great. So all of that is stoichiometrically correct, which means all the C's, all the H's, all the O's on both sides of every one of those equilibrium pairings is correct in terms of the mass involved in that reaction system. However, to suggest that the dissociation of carbonic acid into a bicarbonate ion and a, high, and to a proton will affect the pH is a false statement because pH the concentration of hydronium ions in the water is a dependent variable. 
you cannot moderate the number of hydronium ions in a water sample present at any given time by adding them, and neither can you moderate it directly by removing them. That will not work. I'll explain that during this lecture. So hang tight, stick around to the end. This is great. I love this stuff. This system is known as the bicarbonate buffering system. And then I said that I would make this video if enough of you watched last week's. Well, congratulations. I decided that enough of you did. So that's what we're doing today. Here it comes. pH control and body fluids part two, the bicarbonate buffer. Let's do it. Recap of part one, temperature directly affects pH in pure water. This is actually equally true in all aqueous solutions containing whatever you like. Temperature directly affects the pH. It is an independent moderator. It can do that in concert with the effects on the other three, which are still simultaneously true. Temperature is a control point, an independent variable. pH is a dependent variable aka you cannot change the pH meaningfully by adding nor by removing H3O plus to or from a solution. Won't work. The Chatelier's principle applies. This is how it applies. Adding H3O plus to a solution is a cooling influence on that solution. Because it absorbs heat on the activation side. Cooling the solution or tending to cool the solution reduces the probability of the left to right reaction we spoke about last week that two water molecules will interact meaningfully and produce a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. Ergo, when you add a proton dissociated off an acid, such as just described in this situation, the actual apparent change in the concentration of the ions that occurs due to this act is none. So what we're looking at with these plus H plus, plus two H plus, we are looking at a stoichiometric accountancy tool. We are not looking at anything about objective reality. Um, if you remove hydronium ions from a solution, uh, that's a heating influence, thereby increasing the probability of that reaction and causing a apparent net change in the concentration of none at all. The bicarbonate buffer, as drawn stoichiometrically correctly, is like that. However, the, the H plus and the 2H plus are not something that literally exists. They are an, they are an accountancy tool. Um, the pH is a dependent variable, as described. That's why they don't literally exist as such. Any given H plus, H, H3O plus in the water system has an expected lifespan of less than 10 to the minus 6 seconds, actually. So this is not about accounting for individual bits of mass. And they're actually still accounted for because if they're driven into or pulled out of the water, that doesn't change the amount of mass present. It doesn't breach any law of conservation of mass, even if such a thing was a reality, which it isn't. Uh, the concentration of all of the species in this reaction system, all of them, is determined by the PCO2 at the left-hand end of it, and by the temperature of the fluid pool via its effect on the Kc value in the first place, and also temperature affects all the Ka values of all the other species such that it's that that determines their relative contribution to their concentration in that solution according to the pH of what the solution is. I hope this is going up some flagpoles. Take home messages of today's session. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas is an independent moderator of the pH, as is the temperature. They work in concert, actually, and they have an effect on one another. Okay. That's fantastic. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas is a directly moderatable phenomenon 
the human body uses the lungs, the circulation in general, truly, to achieve the PCO2 that's ideal for driving biological process at that time. It's able to moderate that. And that has an effect on the pH via its independent ability to do so. Fantastic. The bicarbonate ion concentration in an aqueous solution is a dependent variable. And as such, you cannot independently moderate the concentration by adding nor by removing bicarbonate. The system adjusts to counter the perturbance applied by dragging in or via blowing off more carbon dioxide gas. Le Chatelier's principle applies. In an open aqueous pool, the bicarbonate buffer allows for the pH and the pOH to be uncoupled. They are no longer necessarily causally related to one another. They can vary independently because of the fact that some of the hydronium can be added in via acid dissociation at that end of the buffering system. Okay. AKA Le Chatelier's principle holds everything pretty much constant. Pull on any one of the control levers, you'll get a change, a predictable change in the pH. Try and do it from any other angle, the whole system will pour the energy out in all the other different ways to maintain its resistance to perturbation. It's fantastic. In the next lesson, stick around for this. We're going to talk about a thing called the law of electroneutrality, which was proposed by the late Peter Stewart, uh, where he correctly posited, according to, well, really known laws of physics, that there's one that we hadn't really considered previously before him saying, perhaps we should think about this. And here's a teaser of what Peter Stewart came up with. Here is a statement of fact. The net electrochemical charge of all aqueous pools is necessarily zero at all times and at all places in the universe. Were it not so, said aqueous pool would undergo a spontaneous and massive electrical discharge. Given that that does not occur, we know that Peter Stewart is correct. And it makes sense anyway to have a net zero electrochemical charge because that is in line with the conservation of energy law, a law that stands up to a lot better scrutiny than does the one about mass. So that's for another, another day too. Um, that's next week though. We'll talk about Peter Stewart next week and what he came up with and how that was further developed by Michael Lindinger or Lindinger, don't know how to pronounce it, sorry, uh, and others that expounded upon that work and elucidated upon that work that actually eventually led to the development of the model I am here presenting. Because this is really, really important. Right, so stick around and next week I think you'll start to really get a grasp on all of that. So we'll see you then. Ciao.